Folks, we are live. No graphics, no rolling, no nothing. Cold open. Cold. <laughs> okay, folks, we've got a hot hot show here tonight. Um, we've got, first off, I'm going to mention that I'm the gra- grandfather for the second time now, officially. Congratulations. Today at one about 1.46 a.m., something like that, at the North Austin Medical Center, my daughter gave birth to a five pound 12 ounce baby boy brody william chandler is his name mm. so he's get so that little fellow there jacob davis has him a cousin now All right. and then the family's growing so growing that's right so there you have that folks and hopefully we'll get some pictures up and stuff like that uh, here uh, over the next few weeks. We do have a, lot, a completely booked show tonight. Uh, we're going to play a little bit of Terry Liberty. Oh, yeah, the show, actually, I'm going to dedicate this show to Terry Liberty Parker because he he was one of the very, very few yes. that I think provided a clear message as to what was going on. And right. what, Would you agree with that, Gary? Yes, yes. Back in wake, uh, back in nineteen, from the beginning, not just from the, the last day, from the first day, from the first day, yes. yeah, yeah, and that and that was a rare, rare voice. Uh, then we've got uh, our dear friend Y. That's how she wants us to use her public. She's going to call in and bitch about the uh, CNN piece last night uh, concerning the events in Waco, Texas, in nineteen ninety three. And then we've got a uh, 10-minute uh, Waco piece that shows the tanks barging into the into the building and everything and all that, the whole thing. Then we've got Branch Davidian, Branch Davidian survivor Clive Doyle calling in here at a, by around roughly 8.30 p.m. And then at 8.45, we have Branch Davidian survivor Sheila Martin calling in. So it should be a pretty solid show. What do you think, Gary? Oh, definitely. That, that sounds great. It's going to be a good, good show as always. Yeah, pr- pretty much. Uh, and then, of course, we're all we're heading to uh, Waco tomorrow for the annual Mount Carmel Memorial. So that should be that should be good. We've got some film of the bus we're taking, and uh, so we got a lot to do. I'll, but, but before we get to all of that. Oh, I've got to. I've got to talk, ask you guys. The issue of prostitution has come up. You said you thought it was immoral. I say it doesn't really make any difference to me because I've had one night stands when I was a young man where I don't even remember the woman's name. But you know, I don't see much difference between that and if I'd have just slipped someone fifty bucks or whatever. But. <laughs> but uh after dinner in a movie 50 bucks is cheap <laughs> that's right that's right yeah yeah and uh but um u.s senate majority leader harry reed u.s senator from nevada announced three weeks ago that he wants to close down those legal prostitution brothels in the state of nevada did you hear that one, Gary? Have no, you heard? Yeah, oh, yeah. I really hadn't been keeping up with yeah, it. Yeah, that, that was... I thought it was interesting. He said that after the election. <laughs> after the election, yeah. <laughs> and uh, now I want to tie this in, folks, to this serial killer. Everybody's heard about this serial, this suspected serial killer or killers in Long Island. You might not have even heard about it because I know you don't uh, watch hardly any TV yeah, or not. I really don't. Uh, yeah, there's been like ten bodies discovered. Uh, off, of, you, you know about it, right, Gary? You've heard yes. about. It. And uh, but uh, I think Geraldo's been talking about it. <laughs> well, the thing that Geraldo's not going to tell you is the fact that uh, um, four, at least four of those girls, those victims, four of the victims were young girls who were basically were independent prostitutes who advertised on Craigslist. Now, the reason why I bring this up now is because I believe that the prohibition, the laws against prostitution, and the government-enforced prohibition of prostitution is somewhat responsible for those women being dead. 
because basically what what's happened to them is that they're being forced into this black market and uh mm-hmm. And that opens them up to violence and different types of crime. Right. They can't go to the police. They can't go to the police. Same same as if you buy a bag of weed in the black market. Mm-hmm. You can't if you get ripped off, you can't go to the police and say, you know, hey Yeah, yeah this isn't real weed. You right. <laughs> but the point is, folks, is that these prohibitions, whether it be drug prohibition or prostitution prohibition they are causing the vast vast majority of crime here in america would you agree with that gary yes well i think they're certainly making things worse and it's the difference between somebody living and dying i mean you could have a prostitute might be in trouble but she's not going to be killed by a serial killer well if she, if, she, if if there were legal brothel houses in long island like there is in nevada these women, these young women, would would could go just go work there, mm-hmm. and they wouldn't have to be out there on Craigslist in a black market. They could just go to their brothel house, whatever they want to call it, uh, where there, there's security on site. They use protection. The women are tested for STDs on a, on a, a regular basis. So, but by by having a prohibition of it, that forces these women into. A black market, and and I think I think uh, partially I think that's partially the uh, the the prohibition is partially responsible for these women's death. How do you feel about that, Gary? Well, Jeff, uh, like I say, uh, I am against legalizing prostitution. Are you? But Even I, with I those see, facts, I see your point. But the thing is, what we have is just a plain, simple murderer. Regardless if prostitution was legal or illegal, what you have is a simple murderer on the loose. Yes, but you but, but by having the the prohibition, though, you're making it a lot easier for him to get a, get to these women. Well, I mean that that could be true, but you know you're not going to stop those kind of people. You know that are, are intent on murder. Yeah, people. I agree with that. Uh, you know what you're saying. I, I see your point. But uh, uh, just legalizing it won't stop those kind of people from committing those type of crimes. Well, it'll stop it'll stop that avenue for them to have access. It may slow it down. Yes, but, it, yes. But once you have that criminal mind that's going to commit those type of crimes, they don't care. Well, they're not going to go into a brothel house and and. Uh, do that because there's security on site. I mean, it, 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 if I was a prostitute, I'd rather be in a legal brothel house than out in an illegal on a legal black market on, advertising on Craigslist. Yeah, there would be definitely, I would think, be more protection, much more safer. Uh, yeah. Yes. And uh, but anyway, okay. So now we're gonna go first. We're gonna go ahead and, and we're gonna run about five minutes of. Uh, uh, Terry Liberty Parker. This was when about 1994, six or something like that. Okay, Terry Liberty Parker, and then we'll be back. We got Lorraine Denardis coming up. We're gonna bring our uh, Jacob Davis up. We got a big show tonight, folks. So keep it right here. Here is a classic interview with the late great Terry Liberty Parker concerning uh, the in- the uh, uh, incidents in Waco, Texas, in 1993. Go ahead, Mike. Okay. Quick, right back. Assault, the final assault when it was the big fire and everything. Those tanks that we watched on television were not just poking holes in the wall to insert gas into the structure. This is a residence that's occupied by men, women, and children, yet those tanks that we saw, according to this trial testimony, the government's testimony, those tanks were ordered to penetrate this residence occupied by men, women, and children. The strategy, the government's strategy as as described at the trial by the government itself was to bring this structure down. This is a residence occupied by men, women, and children. Our government that is supposed to be based on the ideals of freedom and liberty, uh, justice for all, our government instructed its government agents to climb into tanks and roll those tanks right into a structure 
that's occupied with men, women, and children. And as a result, some of the children that uh, that we were supposed we were told the government was saving died as the structure came down and, and crushed skulls. They died from blunt force trauma to the skull to the, their skulls. Um, it's like this. For people who are wondering, how come there's a militia movement that's growing in this country? Well, you know, it used to be, you know, I'm, I'm over 50, I'm 50 I was 52, uh, just had a birthday just here recently. And we used to use the phrase up in arms as sort of a metaphor, as kind of a joking metaphor. People are up in arms about this or that. But when you have a government that orders its agents to get into tanks and run those tanks through a residence occupied by men, women, and children, and then there are no indictments. There's no indictment of the tank drivers. There's no indictment of the people who ordered the tank drivers. There's no indictment of any of the high officials. At that point, the truce has broken down, and the, and the phrase, up in arms, the people are up in arms, is only, the only thing that's left for them as a reality, instead of it being a metaphor. So yeah, you have a growing militia movement because we now have a government that isn't technically violating the Constitution or technically creating injustices. We've got a government now that does it in a big way, does it on television, doesn't even get to sweep it under the rug, testifies at, at trial that what it did was order its agents to get into tanks and, and run the tanks through a residence occupied by men, by men, women, and children, and there are no indictments of any of these people. At the very least, they should be indicted for manslaughter, if not murder. Uh, we haven't had that happen, and that's why you have a militia movement that's growing in this country. Uh, they see a government that, that may, depending on which aspect of the militia you ask, there's going to be different things that bother them, and maybe you won't agree with them on, on this issue or that issue. But the one point that we can all agree on is you cannot have a government that just arbitrarily kills people, runs tanks through houses, and not even have the agents who drove the tanks be indicted. You cannot have that. At that point, there is no there is no more choice. You have to you have to be up in arms. You have to be ready to deal with that government in the same way that it's dealing with their with their citizens. Now I'm not advocating that we raise an army and go storm Washington DC. Now, this is not a question of going in uh, and invading. This is a question of people feeling the need to be ready to protect themselves with deadly force if they have to against a government that has gone outlaw. To the Branch Davidians, I would say you've been a, you've been treated in a way that that no human being should be treated, let alone let alone people on American soil. Uh, this is an outrage. Uh, it, this cannot be allowed to stand. I am uh, very pleased that Jeff Davis uh, has been pursuing this issue uh, in public access TV. This isn't an issue that's going to be pushed by the establishment media. Good enough. Okay, folks, we are back live here tonight. It is uh, 18 April 2011. Joining us quickly here is just our dear friend, Why Mike? Okay. Hello? Hello. Hi, Jeff. How are you? Hi, why? I sure do miss Terry. I do, too. We all do. Yeah, that's sad. He was a voice that provided reason a lot of times in amongst a sea of propaganda. Yeah. There sure was a lot of white noise on the phone line waiting for to come on. Really? Yeah. I, I think I, it was background noise in the tape. In fact, I'm hearing a lot of uh, crosstalk. Is anything running? I don't know. We're working on it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, why so what's uh Okay, was your son gonna put up the slate for the Mount Carmel Library dot com? Well, I think they're working on it. Yeah. And uh what it is is did you see that CNN show last night? I did not. Did you you did not either, right? I did. I watched about five minutes of it and I couldn't stand it, I turned it off. <laughs> you did what? 
<laughs> I turned it off. How are you ever going to call them on it if you if you don't watch to see what I they're doing? I couldn't stand it. Everybody <laughs> that I've talked to says, oh, well, that's so much better than what they've been doing. And I go, look, a good lie, a bad lie is still a lie. You know, and if the producers are listening to your show that put on the CNN documentary last night, mm -hmm. why don't you people do a little bit of research and get the facts straight? While I've, I've come to the conclusion that uh, it was Vince May actually the one that used this term. I, I think the people in the media are more than anything they're just very shallow oh absolutely they're lazy lazy shallow uh you know when waco came down on february 28 93 it was just one it was just one day they were doing this next day they were doing that next day they were doing this you know it was just yeah a, eight, 18 different reasons as to why they had to, had to do the raid uh, yeah and the only one that stuck was the last one they figured they had gold we'll say he molested young women well that wasn't the ultimate one. you know and the, the thing is they don't sit there and tell everybody that excuse me his wife was 14 when he legally married her I'm, you know, marriage is marriage. Why would the state of Texas sanction the marriage and then turn around and call it molestation? Yeah. You know, well, it there, just uh, aggravates me. The, to me, the one that really got really was, was outrageous was when they when they said he called himself Jesus. Oh yeah, it's, because of the Australian tape. Yeah, and uh, do y'all have that clip? We're running things right now. I'm not sure. No, I'm, I'm saying, you know, if you don't know whether or not you have it in your, you know, mountcarmellibrary.com, uh, that's where people send in their tapes and we digitize them and then post them on our Branch Davidian website. And um, the thing is, we have maybe not the best quality copy of that Australian tape, but I was asking if you had it, because if you don't, I'll see if I can get you a copy of it. Well, Wyla, let me say about the Jesus thing. Most of the Branch Davidians I've talked to uh, have made the claim that Crush never said that. But He didn't. He said, I'm God. Even if he... he said, if I knocked up a 76-year-old Lois Roden, then you better watch out. I'm God. Well, even, you know... But and all they do is clip it and play, I'm God, I'm God, I'm God. Yeah. Wyla, what he's trying to say is, Wyla, it doesn't matter what David Koresh or anybody did. You have agents from the government getting tanks and go, uh, God went in there and killed people. Yeah. That's, That's right. what we're saying. Babies, we don't give a damn what David Koresh said or what Catherine That's Madison nice. believes or, or, or what you believe, Wyla. That's what right. we're saying as patriots... Why did our government get in tanks and kill women and children and men? That's what we're saying, aren't we, Jeff? Gary? Do you want to know the answer yeah, to that see, other than God's it. plan? They well, did it because good... they could. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't well, anything anybody could do. I vowed there'll be no more Wacos. In well, Texas. good luck because they just ran something in, what, Vidor, Texas? Yeah. Yeah, with tanks. Claimed it was a meth lab or something now, on, where, a, on where, a young yeah, couple you, with their two kids. Are you calling from Fort Worth, Wyla? Yes. Okay, uh, you're going to be at the Mount Carmel. Uh, yes, I'll be there tomorrow. Oh, yeah, I'll see. we'll see you there tomorrow then. Okay, and um, what I wanted to do is any of the listeners that are listening, if you have any of the negotiation tapes, I asked Clive to ask for them, but um, what do you call it, Jeff? Junior, I guess, will be putting a slate up there with Clive's P.O. box. We already did. Yeah, we've Good. been doing that. We've they been... couldn't send them or mail them to that, and we'll digitize them. And if they want the actual uh, tape or, or cassette back, we'll give them that back. Otherwise, we'll send them a disc digitized. Cool. Well, yeah. your uh, website, what is the, how do you spell the URL? Uh, it's Mount Carmel Library, M.T. C A R M E L L I B R A R Y dot com. Okay. 
So you abbreviated Mount. Okay. Right. MountCarmelLibrary.com. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Wyatt. Well, hey, thank you, and Clive ought to be calling in about 15 minutes. Okay. Thank you, much. Love you. Bye-bye. Love uh, you, too. See uh, you tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, Lorraine, I got to ask you. Read your Facebook. L- l- the lovely Lorraine Denard is in, t- in the uh, – um, what's your plans? My plans for the sp- – Summer and fall? Yes. Well, I know I'm definitely not going to work at Apple. That was a, another thing that was I was planning. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that I'm going to um, end my lease at the end of the May and then go visit my brother in Mexico, stay there long enough to learn Spanish. And then, then it's up in the air a little bit. If I get my visa stuff worked out for Korea, I'll probably go to Korea. I, it was just mm-hmm. like that one job offer I got one. But I got several job offers. They're, they're really interested in me, but it's um, they turned me down because the visa stuff's not taken care of. So oh. um, I, I kind of want to wait till that's taken care of before I go on any other interviews for that. But it should be taken care of, like, at the end of May. Uh, the other option is that I'm all, uh, applying for the UTeach program at UT, and if I get accepted there, I'll come back in the spring. And then I'll be back in Austin. Well, you've been a tremendous asset down here. I think you've definitely made your imprint down here, and uh, so but you'll be here around for another month or so, right? Definitely, yeah. I'll definitely be around here for another month. I know it's it's very You're hard. You're going up. You going up to Mount Carmel tomorrow? Yes, I am. Cool. It's cool. very hard to leave everything and everybody, but I have been here a long time. I think a break would be good for me. And well, I'm I'll, hoping that you get some. And then I'll come back. I mean, I won't be gone forever. Even if I go to Korea, it's just going to be for a year, and then I'm going to come back. So no matter what, I'm going to come back here. Cool. And I'll probably be keeping in touch via uh, Skype or, oh, yeah. or YouTube. And, I'll okay. make some YouTube videos so you can play them. Yeah. And I'll have stuff on my Facebook. And I plan on doing that. Like, I fell out of the video producing, but... I'm definitely, if I'm in a foreign country, I'll be making video blogs continuously. So I'll be up on top of that. Okay, and then, of course, we got little Jacob Davis. Jacob, can you say hello? Say hi. Say hi. You're on live TV. Jacob, say hi. Say hi. What's that there cow say? Moo. Yeah. Moo. And, uh. Wait, well, hey, you have a cousin now, bro, Brody William Chandler. What did we go see today at the hospital? Brody. Brody. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> little. He knows his name. <laughs> hey, Mike, we've got, uh, let's go ahead and run a little bit of that, and then we'll take it right up to Clive. <laughs> Folks, this is our Waco show tonight. Uh, okay, let me let me mention this. Uh, yeah, once again, going back to Terry Liberty Parker. He was the first one I heard say this. I'm calling for the indictments of starting off with the tank drivers in Waco. I don't think there's statute of limitations on murder, is there? No. So, I mean, just because it's 18 years ago, I think the uh, I'm calling for indictments on the tank drivers and then work our way right on up. Clinton was the president. Janet Reno was the uh, Attorney attorney general. I think I think there should be indictments for murder, minimum what involuntary manslaughter or something. I mean, you just don't get into a tank and drive it into tank. Well, you know, all the survivors were indicted. Oh <laughs> yeah, they were indicted. Yeah, yeah, they were. Blame indi- the victims. Yeah. So go ahead, Gary. Well, Jeff, they were just following orders. Yeah, yeah. I want to. I want to ask y'all. Um, how old were you in, ni- in uh, April 19th, 1993? Um, I was probably about 14 or 15. You remember when it came, when it, when Waco went, came down? I remember it, but I, I didn't watch the news as like religiously as I do now. But what, I do what, remember what's your it. Yes. About it? Um. And I, I'm, I'm, right now I have thoughts about it. Yeah. Yeah. What, what's, what's I, your I definitely. I, I think it's it, it's amazing that the government can abuse their power that way and, and get away with something like that. What did and you it's think, just Gary? A, what did you think, Gary? Well, it's Hold a on to- a minute, Mike. Coming up here. To me, it's a total travesty of the people that were inside that compound to be murdered like that, men, women, and children. Yeah. 
So basically, and Gary, Gary, what was your thought? Well, first of all, I was already mad about the first day. So the yeah. whole, and we were protesting in Waco about it. And, you know, is your church ATF approved and that kind of stuff? So we were running That's around working with signs. And the last day was just incredible because you, you, just when you thought things could not possibly get any worse, they got worse. It was just amazing. Um, and uh, so basically, then none of us here were buffalo by all the propaganda because let's face it the vast vast majority of people were saying and screaming oh yeah run tanks into those buildings Christ said he was um, Jesus I think I did fall for the propaganda did but I you? was only about 14 well, years old yeah, and I, I believe the media yeah, yeah now but you know I, I didn't really watch it with so much to believe it's just that it came on the news and I didn't take it for granted. What about when you saw them tanks busting into that? The building they didn't say that. They, they made they made the the branch of Indians look bad in yeah. the news in the newscast. Well, they were trying to make it like, sound like they set themselves on fire. Oh yeah, yeah. that's that's but Gary's absolutely correct. That's exactly. It was just like passing news. It wasn't. Um, um, I I knew about it. I knew it was happening, but I didn't really understand the comp the complications behind it. Well, implications behind it you know the, a lot of these a lot of these wars and stuff you know you, you you hear this propaganda oh uh he was killing his own people waco texas the american government killed its own people any right. way you look at i'm it. gonna learn a lot tomorrow i'm sure There's when i way go you look at it. it's uh, more of a personal experience of, uh, uh, okay let's go ahead and run it and then then we'll then we'll be up with clive keep it right here lorraine you, you, okay, okay. Okay, we're right gonna here. we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and run a piece put together by by Mike Hansen Archives. Here we go. Time. We knew we were being watched from across the road. We knew there were some kind of government agencies, agents over there. I hear the shots. I go, oh my God, there's going to be a bloodbath. Not only were they shooting at you, but now you had dead federal law enforcement officers outside. It was a whole different ballgame from that point on. We're looking to God to indicate how we play this.
your organization in this United States of America is a liar. You're saying peace with your mouth, but your words are words of a dragon. Visiting the mass murder in Waco, Texas in 1993, Branch Davidians. On the phone with us uh, is uh, one of the uh, Branch Davidian survivors, Mr. Clive Doyle. Clive, are you with us, sir? Yes, we are. How are you doing, Jeff? Great, sir. Good to have you back again, Clive. Um, we're coming down. We're coming up there tomorrow. That's good. We've got a 15 passenger bus we're bringing up for the for the memorial service. Is it going to be full? <laughs> yep, yeah. going to be full. Yep, going to be full. Well, we'll try to make some room for them. Um, first off, Clive, take us back to uh, this uh, tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow, well, the 19th of April, two, uh, 1993. Exactly what was going on at the time and. Uh, uh, you know what? What eventually transpired? Well, uh, just before dawn, they they started to uh, demolish the building with the tanks. They were poking holes uh, into the building, tearing up sections of the building. Uh, they were spraying gas in. They were blocking off uh, areas, trying to separate the people from having contact with one another. Kind of. Uh, Push them into little pockets. This, yeah. Hello. Uh, You're breaking up, uh, Clive. Go it, ahead, Clive. You're getting a lot of feedback on that. Uh, make sure all the audio's turned off in there, Mike. We are not hearing the feedback here. I think. No, uh, I'm not okay. hearing the feedback. Go ahead, but go ahead, Clive. Well, they what they did was they started while it was you know still dark uh, on the 19th, uh, coming in and breaching the building with these uh, CEV tanks with the booms on them, and they were spraying the gas from the booms uh, uh, into various areas. And uh, one of the things that they did probably right off the bat was to uh, take out the, the north northwest corner because they knew there was a, a trap door at the far end of the men's dormitory that would lead down into a bus that was under the ground and uh, would lead into the storm shelter. And so they uh, demolished that corner of the building, hopefully to block off any way of escape uh, by the people inside. And so uh, they were also ramming the front door area and in the back, and they would alternatively come in the front and spray gas, and then another CV at the back would come in from the back and spray gas. And uh, we learned that uh, they were supposed to spray gas in there for 48 hours, uh, and if we hadn't come out in, in two days, then uh, they were to go to Plan B. Plan B involved um, firing the the uh, the rockets uh, the ferret rounds as they call them that they they fired them from four different Bradleys that were positioned at each corner of the building and they would come you know through the windows uh, through some of the holes that they'd made and uh, when they hit something solid they would break open and uh, you know spray the gas out into the room. Uh, and so instead of taking 48 hours to use all of their gas uh, that they had in the uh, for the tanks, you know, for the the spray mechanism, 
they they used it all up in I think like an hour or less, and uh, that's when they resorted to the ferret rounds, and I think they fired about 300 and something of those. So, uh, but fortunately or unfortunately, they penetrated the building in so many different areas that the wind that was blowing 25, 30 mile an hour that day was uh, kind of taking a lot of the effectiveness of the gas inside, taking it away by blowing it, uh, you know, blowing it away. And so, uh, but later on, around noon, when the fire started, uh, all of those holes acted like a, a giant flu, you know, a chimney effect, and that just, the flames just went through the building like crazy. I want to go back to February February 28th, Clive. I want okay. to just... Just clarify, uh, w- bullets on the first first day of the the, the siege, the raid. Uh-huh. Uh, there were bullets coming in from in in, in from inside the hat or from uh, from across the house, uh, down top of the house, from helicopters. And Hel- poor- helicopters were firing down through the roof. And with poor old Winston Blake, he was just he was inside eating a piece of toast. Yeah. Is- Winston Blake was in the men's dormitory section on the first floor, uh, a room that faced out toward the swimming pool at the back. And his room was the only one with a window in it, but you couldn't you couldn't see out of that window because we had f- three huge plastic water tanks uh, that were part of the uh, the water delivery for the kitchen area, and uh, so they blocked any view in or out of his room and uh he was sitting on his bunk eating the remainder of his breakfast i guess and uh they were shooting up our water tanks and he happened to get a a bullet you know bullet killed him while he's just sitting there and just sitting there eating the breakfast right uh so now the i asked you this last last year clive a lot of the people that talk about, that discuss the Waco issue, they 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 mention um, why didn't you all just come out? On April nineteenth, nineteen ninety three. What was the situation about you all coming out? Now keep in mind that the the entire building had razor wire around it, but but anyway, what was the, what was the situation with you all coming out? Because I was told by one of the uh, a lady that wrote a book on Waco that. Um, the, the 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 government had to destroy the building based upon the evidence from the from the bullet fragments and the locations of the bullets. So it was ultimately it, it was pres- presumed by the government that they were going to destroy that building. Well, you know, during the siege, David had had made the remark a uh, couple of times at least that this building was our best evidence that we were telling the truth about the shooting on the. February the 28th, yep. most of the bullet holes were incoming, and, uh, you know, so our uh, my understanding was that uh, when this all came to an end, when it was finally negotiated and we would come out and, and uh, you know, photos would be taken and, and we would prove that what we were saying about the raid uh, were true, but unfortunately... Uh, with the fire, all of that was a- obliterated pretty much. You couldn't tell uh, who shot which way or whatever by April 19th. Well, the, they, uh, the propaganda was that they were negotiating for your all's release. But I, I don't think they ever intended the, to, to keep that building standing. Well, you know, the negotiators were promising one thing. Uh, You know, I've always said that negotiators are professional liars, basically, because they're going to say whatever it takes to get you to surrender, to come out, to release, uh, you know, whether it's a bank holdup or or even if it's a guy standing on the top of a building threatening to jump. They're going to say whatever they think is going to, you know, defuse that situation and and bring it to an end. And and in in many cases, if it's a... uh, you know, like a bank holdup or, or a guy holding hostages, uh, their plan basically is to take him out once they get him out in the open. And uh, so 
the negotiators, you know, we kind of hoped that the negotiators were on the level and, and trustworthy, but we found out as each day went by what what they might promise or, or we might agree to with them uh, was def- was overrun or over, uh, you know, changed by the tactical team, the ones that were actually on the ground in the tanks and in the sniper nests and so forth. Uh, and so you asked why we didn't come out. Well, there was two reasons. One, we'd been told that God said to wait. And that was, you might say, from a religious point of view. But from a physical point of view, we certainly didn't trust uh, the reliability of the FBI uh or, you know, we were always wondering whether if we came out, whether the snipers would shoot us down, whether the tanks would run over us or whatever. And uh, so that was always a, a question of doubt, you know, as to just how we'd be treated. We know that early in the siege that there were people that were negotiated out and it was all supposed to be on the up and up, but some of the people that came out were, uh, you know, met with threatening uh, statements and, and made to... Uh, stripped right. down and things like that to where, uh, you know, it didn't sit well with the, the ones on the inside that were still waiting their turn, you might say. So uh, after a certain period of time, because things that had been agreed on through the negotiators uh, weren't always kept by the FBI or, or the ATF, then uh, eventually the people just decide to wait on God. Uh, wait for God to indicate what we were going to do. And toward the end of the siege, uh, it had been agreed upon that if if uh, David could write out his beliefs on the book of Revelation, on the seven seals, that we would all come out. And uh, when that was agreed to, and, that, and you know, the FBI negotiators told us uh, that they didn't want any more bloodshed and they'd, they were willing to wait, if it, even if it took a couple of weeks to, to get this manuscript uh, typed up and everything, uh, they were prepared to wait. But the very next day, in come the tanks, and, and you know, everybody well, saw on TV what the result was. Now you uh, you were you were trapped inside, and you ended up scrambling for your life inside there on April 19th. You got your um, your hands were burned, right? You, my hands, my neck, my leg. Uh, trying to escape. Uh, do you have any? Do you have a question, Gary? Okay. Yeah, yeah. We got your daughter up there, uh, Clive. A picture of your daughter. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Gary. Yeah. How many uh, actual survivors were there? There's only nine made it out of the fire alive. There was. There was about. Um, 70, 76, I believe, died in the fire. There had been um, six die on the first day when the uh, when the attack took place. Seventeen children died on uh, April nineteenth, right? Uh, up to a certain age. There was actually more children than that. But if you went up to like twenty one or so, uh, there was even more than seventeen. But there were seventeen smaller children. Go ahead, Gary. Clive. Tell us how you got out, how you physically walked out of there. Well, the area I was in was in a little narrow walkway behind a petition on the on the on the chapel stage or, or rostrum. Um, when we first heard the building was on fire, several of us had gone in behind that, and on the wall, the south wall of the chapel, uh, there'd been a hole knocked in the wall by the tank. And, uh, you know, there was all a big heap of rubble inside, sheetrock and two-by-fours and things like that that they'd pushed in. And so uh, David Thibodeau and myself were probably the first ones to get to the hole. But like I said, we were looking out, uh, wondering, well, if we jumped out, uh, would the, there was a tank just across uh, the driveway from us. There were snipers that we could see outside of the tanks. Uh, we weren't sure whether they'd start shooting. So we kind of hesitated a bit, and just shortly after that, uh, all this smoke started coming down the outside of the uh, the wall from the, from the front end of the building toward the back. And as it came by this hole that we were looking out of, it just kind of all got sucked in, and from then on everything turned pitch black. Mm-hmm. 
and uh, all of a sudden there was heat overhead so intense that it, it pushed me down on the floor. I was kind of rolling around on the floor, um, you know, praying and, and, and kind of in pain. And uh, I'm praying basically to God saying, God, if you're going to do a miracle, you better hurry up because it's getting hot, you know. And uh, shortly after that, I can I can recall hearing uh, different ones that had come in behind us that were further back in, in the building. Uh, I could hear them screaming, and that kind of galvanized me to jump up and uh, head toward the hole. And you couldn't just walk out. You had to climb over all this rubble that was there. And when I got out... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the skin was just rolling off my hands. My jackets were all smoking and melting all over me. And uh, I kind of looked over my shoulder at the hole that I'd come out of, and it was just a mass of flames. You couldn't see any flames inside. It was just pitch black. But when I got to the outside and looked back, it was just a mass of flames. The first thought I, I can remember is thinking, well, isn't anybody coming out there? I thought I was the only one that had made it out. And it wasn't until I uh, started to walk away from the building and ran into the razor wire that they'd put all around us. Uh, and I'm thinking, well, now what do I do? You know, where do I go? And I looked to my left, which was toward the back of the property, and uh, couldn't see anybody, couldn't see any way through the barbed wire. And, and so I looked to my right, and I noticed four guys about halfway up the driveway toward the front gate with their hands in the air. And I thought, wow. That's some of our guys, you know, and uh, not only that, but three of them had come out uh, the same area that I was in, and yet me rolling around on the floor and, uh, and all the noise that was going on with the flames and the people screaming and everything, I hadn't heard anybody leave. I hadn't heard anybody say, well, follow me or let's go or anything like that. And uh, so, like I say, by the time I got out, they were already halfway up the driveway. But that was kind of a great relief in a sense because I thought well if if four of us have four or five of us have got out maybe there's others but uh, you know didn't take too long to find out there wasn't a whole lot others that made it out there was um, two girls that jumped out of windows that were survivors well three girls actually and uh then later on, we found out there was another guy that had gone out of the chapel on the backside and, and hid in a, a cinder block building over near the swimming pool. And uh, in all, there was only nine of us that survived that. Because when I finally got up to the front and was arrested with, along with the other four, uh, and you look back, you know, you see the the big uh, fireball that seemed to go off in the uh, at the back somewhere in the middle of the building and. Uh, it was pretty horrendous. You, you, you kind of you knew that there wasn't too many coming out after that. Um, uh, uh, finally, Clive, I want to ask you: uh, Are there all the um, after the April nineteenth massacre, uh, government massacre? Then, then several of the Branch Davidians uh, had uh, court appearances and faced. Um, jail time and things like that. Are there any, uh, I know Paul Fott is out, but are there any more Branch Davidians that are still in jail at this point? No, they've, they've all finally been released. What what happened was uh, I was one of the ones that was put on trial down in San Antonio. There were uh, 11 of us that, that went on trial. The trial went on for seven, I think, seven and a half weeks, and uh, to cut a long story short, uh, it ended up with three of us walking away exonerated. And the rest of them were basically uh, given lesser charter. Everybody had been found not guilty of uh, conspiracy to murder federal agents and aiding and abetting the murder of federal agents. But some of the ones that were there had gun charges uh, put on them. And so uh, when it came down to sentencing, the the judge gave most of the guys 40 years, and we we all had to go to uh, the Supreme Court, I think, twice before the Supreme Court ordered that the, the uh, 40 years be reduced, and they reduced it down to 15. Most of the guys got out uh, early through good behavior and so forth in, in prison, 
Livingston Fagan from England was the last one to get out. He's mm-hmm. back in England now. But one of the ones that got out, uh, one of the younger guys from California, Jamie Castillo, uh, didn't live too long after he got out. He ended up dying of hepatitis out in California. So out of the uh, the 11 of us that were put on trial, there's, there's one that's no longer with us. Of course, Paul Fada, he, uh, he spent 12 years in prison for a conspiracy to kill a federal agent. And, and he, he wasn't and, even there. He wasn't even in Waco at the time for right. during that whole time. Right. So he was just, here in Austin. Just yeah. really outrageous stuff. Yeah. I talked to him just the other night. Is he going to be there tomorrow? I tried to encourage him to be there, and I don't know whether he's going to make it or not. I haven't heard for sure. He said he might try and get a ticket, but that was kind of late. You know, he was thinking about it pretty late, so whether he got a, a chance to make it or not, I don't know. We'll see tomorrow, I guess. Okay, Clive. Uh, I appreciate your time, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Right there, folks. Right there, open to the public. Uh, 2011 Waco Memorial Service, Country Inn and Suites. It's right there off 30. Right there off 35. So, okay, Mike. Can we go to? Uh, let's go to Mike Moore real quick. I'm told this is. Hello. Hey, Jeff. Hey, Mike Moore from calling for you. Calling for Wichita Falls. Yeah, that I am. Okay. Well, how you doing, Mike? Oh, not too bad. I uh, just wanted to give a shout out to everybody and say that everything's going on okay so far. But uh, I don't know if you've noticed the stuff in the last uh, week, week and a half or so. But uh, we've been having a rash of wildfires in this area, and uh, it's getting really, really bad, dry conditions out here right now. So I mean, as much as everybody's praying for and remembering the Davidians down there in Waco and stuff, they need to. Keep everyone else in their prayers and uh, protect the firefighters that are out there trying to protect us because uh, that's they're out there risking their lives every day. We've got a serious drought in this area, and the uh, weather conditions aren't helping matters much. Yeah, and uh, uh, tom- uh, tomorrow, Mike, we're going up to Waco, several of us. It's- yeah, I'm, yeah, I know. I've, I've got some business I have to take care of in town. We'll be off that day, but unfortunately, I can't make it to Waco myself. Yeah, I really like to go, but well, it's... Uh, I did have one question and stuff about the whole Waco incident that's been kind of troubling to me. One question and a comment: Was it ever determined what actually started the fire that burned the building down? Uh, you know, I I uh, I don't even consider that to be a point anymore because all that really matters is is that. Uh, you know, these government agents jumped into tanks and drove those tanks into these buildings where they knew men, women, and children were inside. That's that's mass that's mass murder right there. You know, what I've heard is that uh, a lantern fell over. That was one our statement. And also, this, this gas was made it a whole lot worse. It made it it just spread. Uh, yeah, it was CS gas as opposed to uh, C. Uh, I mean, pepper spray and stuff so i mean it was it was essentially um tear gas that the military uses it's the same thing anyone that's been a recruit in the military knows it full well when you have to go in the gas chamber and breathe it in and stuff that's exactly what they were using at the time yeah so and like jeff said you know they shouldn't have been there in the, the the fed shouldn't have been there in the first place you know? right right okay. well one thing is that you know, a lot of people don't seem to know about the whole Idea, and I don't know if it's rumor or if it was innuendo spread by the disinformation people around the time that Waco was going on, but there were a lot of people here in Wichita Falls that were spreading all kinds of uh, terrible rumors and stuff about the Davidians and David Koresh and what have you, uh, about them have actually have been here in some of the parks and uh, some of the other areas trying to stir up trouble and Wichita Falls before all that happened. Now, I don't know if there's any truth in it, but, I mean, I've heard it from several different people, including one of the ones that was actually spreading the rumors and confronted them about it because they couldn't answer my question about, you know, why would the, you know, there be such a show of force? I mean, if these people were such a, such a dire threat, 
then why didn't the sheriff take care of it, you know, but prior to? Yeah. And then I come to find out from talking to Clive Doyle later on and David Thibodeau and a couple other survivors and stuff later at one of the events that we had in Austin that in actuality and stuff, the sheriff was on good terms with the majority of them and, yeah. and knew what was going on. So, I mean, it was obvious that it was um, – you know, an exercise in power to just to see what they could get away with, wow. strictly to, strictly to increase the budget. I mean, that's the way that's the way these criminals operate. Uh, to me, it doesn't even make any difference. Most of the, the the stuff that was reported in the first week or so was at those daily FBI news conferences were just a bunch of bullshit. But even even if they were all true, you still can't go from all of the from what they were saying. To government agents driving tanks into buildings, mm-hmm. you just you just can't get to that point, regardless well, of what was going on. Well, never there. mind, never mind the, the them driving the tanks in the building, Jeff. That's just kind of icing on the cake. What about them just coming up there into the into the building and stuff and just shooting the place up, which is what allegedly happened. I mean, the on the, the first, first front, day, the front doors are still missing and mm. never been recovered. Probably destroyed and have been turned into matches by now and. You know, so, I mean, you know, that that proof right there is gone that, that well, they were shooting into the building. Well, which, Mike, like there, said, there's... David Thibodeau and a few others, well, survivors that told me that. So. There's, there's theories that that's the reason why they had to destroy the building. If they left that building intact for people to see the... Okay. Okay, Mike, we got to get... Hey, thanks for calling in, brother. Good to hear All from right. you, Mike. All righty. Okay, we're going to play this little piece here and then... Uh, Come back to wrap it up. How many, okay, first question is how many, how, which one of you two were held against your will in Mount Carmel? <laughs> I didn't even want to come out. What do you mean against your will? Now we're just going to start it off we, with we this. We held no the... prisoners or captives. <laughs> we, we had two young men that came in from outside during the siege that snuck right. in there through the uh, FBI um, cordon that they had around us, and uh, both of them left before it was over. We but even before the how many, okay, first question is, how many, how, which one of you two were held against your will in Mount Carmel? <laughs> I didn't even want to come out. What do you mean against your will? Now we're just going to start it off we, with We held no the... prisoners or captives. <laughs> we, we had two young men that came in from outside during the siege that snuck right. in there through the uh, FBI um, cordon that they had around us, and uh, both of them left before it was over. We but even before the siege, I mean, everyone, I mean, anyone could basically join. You just had to kind of have the beliefs. You could live. Okay, folks, that wraps it up for tonight. For quick final comment, you got 10 seconds. I, you know, we've got to remember this and make sure something like this never happens again. And indictments for the tank drivers. Very quick. Uh, it was a travesty, and I hope you all uh, have a good, safe trip tomorrow. We start to be with you. Lorraine, final. Bye-bye. Um, I guess I'm going to learn a lot tomorrow. Yes, you will. Yes. Yes, you will. Okay, that's it, folks.